My lecture today is directed to revisiting the Essex Lopresti injury, or more appropriately, axial longitudinal instability of the forearm, which implies an injury to the interosseous membrane. I have no relevant disclosures to this talk. My conflicts are represented on this slide. Injury patterns that involve the interosseous membrane include dislocations of the distal radial ulnar joint, the very common distal radial fracture, and the less common Galeazzi and Essex Lopresti fracture patterns. The French anatomist Marie Francois Hennigan was the first to define the interosseous membrane as a strong ligamentous complex that linked the radius and the ulna. Further research has refined the interosseous membrane into three portions with five distinct, distinct components. The middle ligamentous complex contains the central band and accessory bands. It is the central band, which is the major load-bearing portion, and plays a role in axial stability of the forearm. The distal membranous portion contains the dorsal oblique bundle. The dorsal oblique bundle is important for distal radial ulnar joint stability and plays a role in distal radial fractures. Finally, the proximal membranous portion contains the proximal oblique cord and the dorsal oblique accessory cord. They function to help stabilize the proximal radial ulnar joint. The central band is the widest and thickest ligament of the complex. Its center originates from approximately two-thirds of the radial length from the radial styloid and inserts at approximately one-third of the ulnar length from the ulnar styloid. The fibers run obliquely from the proximal radius to the distal ulna at a 21 degree orientation to the long axis of the forearm. The central band primarily attaches on the volar aspect of the apex of the radius and on the dorsal aspect of the ulna. Microscopic studies have confirmed that the makeup of the central band is ligamentous and nature with very little elastin and far different from tendon tissue. Biomechanical studies have correlated its modulus of elasticity and tensile strength as similar to that of the anterior cruciate ligament of the knee. The dorsal oblique bundle originates from approximately the distal one-sixth area of the ulnar shaft at roughly the proximal border of the pronator quadratus and runs distally towards the distal radial ulnar joint. Its fibers blend into the capsular tissue of the distal radial ulnar joint to insert on the inferior rim of the sigmoid notch of the radius. Some fibers continue to blend into the dorsal and palmar radial ulnar ligaments of the triangular fiber cartilage. This bundle is present in 85% of specimens and is involved in the stability of the distal radial ulnar joint in all forearm rotation positions and is isometric in all positions. One way to visualize forearm function is to think of it as one joint with two condyles that move through an arc of motion very similar to a bucket handle. The central band provides the central stabilizer and the proximal and distal ligament complexes provide added transverse and axial stability. Much like the interaction of the cruciates and collateral ligaments of the knee. Furthermore, injury to any part of the forearm joint raises the likelihood of reciprocal injury along its axis. These ligaments then help to coordinate a stable transition of the radius as it dances around the ulna from supination to pronation and back again. The central axis of this rotation is a line drawn from the distal ulna to the proximal radial head. While often dismissed as a load-bearing joint, the distal radial ulnar joint is subject to significant axial and transverse loading. 
Just a real ulnar joint stability is therefore critical in assessing forearm interosseous membrane injuries. In testing distal radial ulnar joint instability, it should be done in both the pronated, supinated, and neutral positions and can range from subtle laxity to multidirectional gross instability. Contributors to distal radial ulnar joint instability are essentially five. Number one, osseous anatomy. Number two, the soft tissue restraints, including the triangular fiber cartilage complex, the pronator quadratus, the extensor carpi ulnaris and its underlying sheath, and the distal oblique bundle. Bony geometry contributes to only about 20% of such stability. In fact, the sigmoid notch accepts only 50 to 60% of the articular convexity of the ulnar head, and much of the articular surface lies against the triangular fiber cartilage and capsule. As far as soft tissue constraints, the triangular fiber cartilage complex plays a major role. It consists of the articular disc, the dorsal and volar radial ulnar ligaments, the ulnar extrinsic ligaments, and the extensor carpi ulnaris and its underlying sheath. The triangular fiber cartilage arises from the medial aspect of the radius and travels to a dual insertion in the soft tissue and foveal area of the ulna. It is this foveal insertion of the deep fibers which play a major role in anchoring the stability of the distal radial ulnar joint. The superficial fibers of the triangular fiber cartilage form an acute angle and insert into soft tissue. This compares to the deep fibers which form a broader angle and insert at the ulnar fovea, thus controlling endpoint stability. Sectioning studies of the triangular fiber cartilage complex have shown the major stabilizers are the triangular fiber cartilage deep foveal fibers and the distal oblique bundle as major stabilizers. The ulnar extrinsic ligaments play no role in distal radial ulnar joint stability. We have discussed previously the distal oblique bundle as it plays a major role not only in transverse stability but in longitudinal stability. The central band thus helps to lessen the radiocapitellar load by transferring the applied wrist load to the ulnar trochlea interface. When the central band is intact, the applied wrist load is equalized across the radiocapitellar and ulnar trochlear joints at the elbow. When it is disrupted, the wrist load transmit di transmits directly to the respective contact points with the radiocapitellar joint experiencing the, bl the bulk of the applied distal load. Furthermore, Markov has shown that the strain in the central band is minimal when the elbow is in valgus and increases maximally when the elbow is in varus. Besides its role in axial load transfer and stability, the central band also contributes to maintaining transverse stability of the forearm. Floffel calculated a transverse radial force vector of almost 20% supplied by the central band. In a more recent paper, Werner analyzed the respective contributions of the various components of the interosseous membrane in preventing splaying of the radius and ulna. While the, cute, while the central band was most important in axial longitudinal stability, it accounted for almost a quarter of transverse stability. The radial head and its contact force against the capitellum is the major restraint to axial instability. As long as it is intact and located, primary axial instability will be prevented. Once it is compromised by excision or dislocation, 
axial stability relies on the secondary constraints, the triangular fiber cartilage complex and the central band of the interosseous membrane. In early studies of axial instability, the key question was whether the central band or the triangular fiber cartilage complex was more central to restoring such stability. Papers were divided with some supporting the triangular fiber cartilage and others a central band. Jim Skayen, in a biomechanical analysis using three space tracking systems and DVRT strain gauges in the central band, was able to prove that both the triangular fiber cartilage complex and the central band were equally critical to maintaining or restoring longitudinal stability once the radial head had been resected. With radial head excision, with compromise of the triangular fiber cartilage and distal oblique bundle, and compromise of the central band, longitudinal instability occurs. Thus, following radial head excision, loss of the radial head capitellar contact creates axial instability in the forearm, leading to proximal radius migration and progressive wrist pain with ulnar impaction. Peter Gordon Essex Lepresti, a British orthopedic trauma surgeon, described this injury pattern in a JBJS paper in 1951. At the time, he was more famous for his classification of calcaneal fractures and for defining a wound triage system founded from his World War II experiences. He died unexpectedly at age 35 from a heart attack while operating on a pelvic fracture. His colleagues posthumously published his report of two cases forever associating his name with the injury pattern. Thus, the eponym for a radial head fracture with an associated distal renal ulnar joint injury and subsequent axial instability is called the Essex Lepresti injury. The first case was that of a 46 year old patient who sustained a compressive injury to his forearm. Essex Lepresti excised the comminuted radial head fracture and noted the rapid proximal migration of the radius with resultant disability at both the wrist and elbow. His second case described a similar axial load injury and a fall from a ladder. This patient sustained a comminuted radial head fracture and recognized distal radial ulnar joint instability. Given the poor outcomes of his first case, Essex Depresti decided to treat the radial head with open reduction internal fixation and closed reduction of the distal radial ulnar joint. At one year, the outcome showed good elbow motion, a pronation supination arc of 45 degrees, and no secondary surgery required. Based on these two cases, he concluded that one with a radial head fracture was important to identify distal radial ulnar joint instability. Two, if such instability was found, one should preserve the radial head. Three, if the radial head could not be preserved, then one should consider the use of a radial head prosthesis. Such prostheses were even rarer at the time, with a vitalium cap having been just developed by Speed in 1941. We now recognize two scenarios of longitudinal instability. One, acute, that occurs at the time of the initial injury, and two, chronic, which occurs over time and only after radial head excision. As with many things, the first description of the acute injury is not that of Essex Lepresti, but occurred five years earlier by Kerr and Co., who reported on one case of radial head fracture and distal radial ulnar joint dislocation. The patient was treated non-operatively with a result of complete loss of forearm rotation. Their paper speculated on interosseous membrane injury.
The chronic scenario was defined 20 years before Essex the Prestry by Brockman in 1930 when he described two cases of disability at the wrist joined following excision of the radial head. The incidence of Essex the Presti injury is rare. Most textbooks listed at 1% of all radial head fractures. Duckworth, who did a more systematic analysis in 211, thought it was a portion of 9% of radial head fractures. One thing is certain, the acute injury is only correctly diagnosed a quarter of the time in a paper as identified in a paper by Truesdale. Edwards and Jupiter felt it was underdiagnosed in more than 50% of cases. In our series of 106 consecutive Essex Lopresti injuries, the initial diagnosis was made correctly in only 38%. 15% of those cases resulted in malpractice suits because of their poor outcome. How often does excision of the radial head result in ulnar impaction and disability at the wrist? In a meta-analysis of 414 cases from the literature, there is x-ray evidence of proximal radial migration in nearly half but symptomatic subluxation occurred in only 24%. In an early British paper by, Dale, by Taylor, published just 13 years after Essex Lepresti's initial contribution, over 50% of the patients had symptomatic distal radial ulnar joint problems following radial head excision, period. By contrast, if the potential for longitudinal instability is identified early, appropriate initial treatment resulted in 78 to 88% good to excellent results. In summary, blow the acute diagnosis and there are damage consequences to pay. In a similar study by Schnetzky, published in 2017, excellent results were obtained if the instability was identified initially. Those with early diagnosis and treatment consistent with appropriate radial head treatment by repair or prosthesis and closed reduction of the distal radial ulnar joint yielded a satisfactory outcome at five years. Those whose treatment began later than seven months had a deteriorated outcome. The key to a successful outcome in the Essex Lepresti injury lies first in preventing a missed diagnosis, and once that diagnosis is made, following a defined treatment algorithm. Any scenario of significant elbow trauma should start your Essex Lopresti antenna buzzing. While usually associated with a displaced or comminuted radial head fracture, any radial head fracture is suspect as are other elbow injuries. In a prospective study of 14 patients with a Mason 1 radial head fracture, using MRI to diagnose the central band injury, Hausman noted that 64% showed evidence of edema and abnormality in the ligament area. Thus, IOM injury is more frequent than generally expected. In the setting of a radial head fracture or other elbow injury, a clinical examination should note any tenderness or instability at the distal radial ulnar joint. The mid forearm directly over the central band should be palpated and any tenderness noted. Aside from the elbow x-ray, 
plane imaging of the wrist with attention to ulnar variants is helpful, as is a distal radial ulnar joint lateral. In certain cases, comparison views of the opposite wrist may shed further light, and load films can be helpful. Load films are done by having the injured patient grasp the examiner's hand or a JMI dynamometer while x-raying for shift or change in distal radial ulnar joint variants. In this acute case, plain films of the complex elbow injury are augmented by CAT scan images. As importantly, plain radiographs of the wrist confirm a displaced distal radial fracture and the marked proximal migration of the radius, indicating a concomitant distal radial ulnar joint and central band injury. Other advanced imaging in the acute scenario has been less than clinically helpful. A triple phase bone scan will definitely pick up the elbow injury and occasionally the distal radial ulnar joint injury, but fails to define the central band disruption. An MRI can consistently visualize the central band, especially on axial T2 fat suppressed images. A disruption of the central band can also be identified as shown by multiple investigators. Unfortunately, such clear images have been created in the cadaver lab and when used clinically, often yield inconclusive readings with the phrase IOM abnormality detected clinical correlation suggested. So MRIs are particularly useful for cadaver arms, but are not as helpful in diagnosing the acute clinical case. Likewise, Fela has shown that ultrasound can correctly identify the central band and show when disruptions are present, period. It has the same problem with clinical correlation. Once an acute Essex Lepresti injury is identified, my approach is to devise a treatment strategy for each level of joint injury, the elbow, the wrist, and the forearm. The radial head is the primary defense against longitudinal migration, and thus the main strategy at the elbow is to preserve the radial head. The availability of smaller and more versatile implants allows a fixation of two and three-part radial head fractures. This 34-year-old patient sustained a comminuted radial head fracture associated with longitudinal instability following a fall down a stairway. He was treated with open reduction and fixation of his two-part radial head fracture, arthroscopic assisted repair of the foveal TFC, and suture button stabilization of the IOM. At 14 months, he shows full elbow and wrist motion, functional though not full forearm rotation, a near normal grip strength, and a full return to unrestricted activity. Saving the real head or possibly maintaining it as a temporary natural spacer may prevent longitudinal instability. Paul reported a series of radial head and neck fractures treated by open reduction in internal fixation that yielded excellent results and showed no cases of wrist disability even after late radial head resection. In a later prospective series, Ikeda confirmed that preserving comminuted radial head fractures gave a superior outcome compared to radial head excision with no risk problems in the ORIF group. If the radial head is dusted and irreparable, 
and associated with axial or valgus instability, the game plan is replacement of the radial head. There are a number of radial head prostheses available, and choosing one is at the comfort and discretion of the operating surgeon, as no prosthesis has proven superior in the axial instability scenario. Furthermore, any radial implant has associated complications such as radial shaft fixation, overstuffing, dislocation, and rotatory stiffness. The effect of a loaded metal prosthesis on capitellar cartilage remains unknown in the absence of long-term data. Past history would suggest that cartilage wear is inevitable. If there is no axial instability, is radial head replacement, replacement necessary? In a long-term follow-up study averaging two and a half decades, Antuna showed that radial head excision under 40 produced excellent results in the majority of patients. He noted near full elbow and forearm motion and functional grip strength. 11% of the patients, which correlates with the incidence of axial instability, had proximal migration and wrist pain. Almost all patients had some valgus elbow deformity, and almost all had radiographic signs of elbow arthritis. If the majority of isolated radial head fractures do well without replacement, it is important to determine those that are unstable and will deteriorate. Given an incidence of axial instability that averages around 10%, it is important to identify those unstable cases in which replacement is necessary. Many times the decision is straightforward. The preoperative exam and imaging show disruption of the distal radial ulnar joint. In some cases, however, the instability is more subtle and evident only after radial head excision. In those cases, I do three tests to help determine the presence of axial instability. The first is a push-pull test popularized by David Roosh and colleagues. The examiner pulls on the proximal radial shaft while monitoring fluoroscopically distal ulnar variants. A change greater than three and under six millimeters raises concern, while a six millimeter shift is conclusive. The second test was devised by Ralph Renning and yours truly. It uses a combination of distal traction and compression and monitoring of ulnar variants fluoroscopically. An added difference of six millimeters implies instability. Lastly, the rail test, short for radial axial interosseous load, simply compresses the wrist distally. If the resected radius abuts the capitellum, axial instability is felt to be present. So when do I use a radial head prosthesis? When there is axial instability or significant valgus instability? I will admit that filling the space seems more physiologic and it is fun surgery to do. We should also realize the role of the medical industry with its 14 different models of prosthesis plays in driving our perceptions. When I use a prosthesis in an axial instability case, I always plan on addressing the other two levels of injury, the wrist and the forearm IOM. Without such distal stabilization, the prosthesis will be exposed to unrestrained axial load, which can lead to unacceptable stresses at the capitellar interface and ultimate failure. The strategy at the wrist addresses the distal radial ulnar joint instability by repairing the foveal attachment of the triangular fiber cartilage in either an open or arthroscopic assisted fashion. In some cases where such a foveal repair is insufficient and leaves persistent instability, 
I will reconstruct the distal oblique bundle. Wright has published an excellent method for this reconstruction in using a tenon graft from the ulna to the radius. In the axial instability case, this has proven more reliable than an Adams radial ulnar ligament reconstruction. Brink described a less invasive alternative method for distal oblique bundle reconstruction, which was used in this case. The bottom line is that a stable distal radial ulnar joint adds significantly to axial longitudinal stability. The final piece of the longitudinal instability puzzle is the forearm. In the acute situation, the most obvious seeming approach would be direct central band repair. The central band can be easily exposed by dissecting proximally between the extensor digitorum communis and the extensor digiti quinti minimi intervals. In a series of 10 acute cases where the central band was explored, the disruption arose directly from the ulna in only 20% of cases. In this scenario, the use of anchors and strong suture may be considered. Unfortunately, the majority of disruptions are central in nature, where suture coaptation is flimsy at best. That raises the question of whether a torn central band can heal. The ligament is more like a thin fascial sheet whose torn ends do not align in any forearm position. Furthermore, the forearm muscles herniate into the gap, further separating the torn ends. And finally, the radius and ulna, now without a major transverse restraint, splay apart. Werner has calculated the divergence to be significant, almost doubling from 13 millimeters when an in, in an intact ligament to 24 millimeters when the IOM is disrupted. This may explain why earlier attempts such as prolonged immobilization or transient stabilization of the forearm with K-wires or syndesmotic screws were unpredictable. This has led me to believe that the central band needs augmentation in the acute injury and reconstruction in the chronic scenario. Gary Kuzma and David Roosh devised an excellent technique to augment the central band based on rerouting a slip of the pronator teres fascia. Through an incision on the radial aspect of the forearm, the pronator teres fascia is elevated. Its distal attachment is preserved and may be augmented by a suture anchor as it is the pivot point of the fascial rotation. The pronator fascia slip is then tunneled dorsally to the original interosseous membrane at an angle of 20 degrees and attached tautly to the ulna with the forearm in a neutral position. This, contra this construct thus mimics the original central band. While the pronator teres rerouting is effective in the acute situation, it is time-consuming and adds further operative time to a procedure that is already filled with the radial head and distal ulnar surgery. For this reason, investigators have looked for a quicker solution to central band stability, hence the concept of using a suture button. Laboratory studies by Drake and Cam showed that such a suture button construct could provide immediate forearm stability. Our, our group began using this technique clinically in acute Essex Lepresti injuries and in some cases of chronic instability. Gaspar reported our short-term results in 2016. At three years, the clinical results were similar to our pronator teres rerouting cases. Range of motion of the elbow, forearm, and wrist were maintained, and grip strength and dash scores improved. Radiographic parameters based on ulnar variance showed maintenance of the stability over time. We concluded, as did a similar study by Siegelman, that the suture button construct 
was an effective adjunct for central band stabilization, provided that the elbow and wrist had been stabilized. In summary, my repair algorithm for the acute Esley's Lepresti injury at the elbow is radial head repair or replacement. At the wrist level, repair of the triangular fiber cartilage or reconstruction of the distal oblique bundle. At the central band level, augmenting the central band with a pronator teres transfer or a suture button. Following those principles led to a successful outcome in this 49-year-old with a bicycle crash and acute longinal instability with a radial head comminuted in multiple pieces. He was treated with a radial head prosthesis, open foveal TFC repair, and pronator teres rerouting augmentation of the central band. A two-year follow-up showed no pain, full range of motion, and normal grip. More common than the acute Essex Lepresti injury in our center is the missed axial instability post radial head resection that presents with a painful ulnar impaction at the wrist. Again, every level of the axial instability needs to be addressed. For the wrist, the answer is ulnar shortening, ulnar shortening, ulnar shortening. The shortening required is off between 3 and 10 millimeters and requires a compression jig or double cut using the current ulnar shortening plate constructs. There are a number of ulnar shortening systems available and all allow the appropriate amount of shortening which is two millimeters of negative ulnar variance. The ulnar impaction syndrome is associated with central TFC disruption, often chondral arthritis of the lunate and distal ulna, and lunatotriquetral ligament disruption. I prefer performing a wrist arthroscopy at the time of the ulnar shortening as it allows me to debride the torn triangular fiber cartilage and perform a synovectomy of the painful wrist, as well as assess the condition of the LT ligament and impaction arthritis. The arthroscopy itself, however, does not generally alter my ulnar shortening plans. In long-standing cases where the distal rear ulnar joint is itself arthritic and unstable, I have adopted a salvage technique as compared to the ulnar shortening osteotomy, which I consider reconstructive. In such cases, I have used the constrained distal radial ulnar joint prosthesis developed by Dr. Lewis Shecker. This prosthesis addresses the three components of the deformity, the ulnar impaction, the instability, and the distal radial ulnar joint arthritis. This is a salvage procedure and requires long-term validation, but early results have provided a satisfactory outcome as documented in this case of Dr. Shecker's. The elbow strategy in chronic lesions remains unclear. What is clear is that a prosthesis that still faces axial instability does not do well. The persistent axial force contact of prosthetic metal on capitella cartilage leads to ongoing pain, arthritis, and poor function. In chronic Essex Lepresti reconstructions, I have removed more prostheses than I have put in. The sustained proximal migration of the radial shaft has altered the radial space, making prosthetic insertion more difficult. All of our first series of chronic reconstructions were done without radial head replacement. Long-term results suggested that such replacement was superfluous to the maintenance of axial stability, as distal reconstruction alone prevented further proximal shaft impingement. That said, a laboratory paper by Ann Ouellette suggests the combination of radial head replacement 
and bone ligament bone reconstruction of the central band was most likely to mimic the pre-injury biomechanics. My current indications are when there is significant valgus deformity or lateral lateral insufficiency at the elbow. This leads to an implantation rate of roughly 25%. Reconstruction of the central band has been the stalwart method of restoring axial stability in the chronic situation. Almost every tendon in the body has been tried without predictable outcomes. Replacement of a ligament with a tendon is like asking a rubber band to replace a nail. Tejwani and Benheim tested a number of possible graphs and compared them to the intact central band. Patellar bone, ligament bone, came closest to matching the original's mechanical properties. It should be noted, however, that no graft reconstruction was as good as the native tissue. In our initial clinical series, we used patella bone ligament bone autograft. Subsequently, to avoid a separate knee incision with its inherent problems, we switched to allograft. No noticeable fall off in results have been noted. The central band originates from the mid shaft of the radius and angles towards the ulna at 20 to 25 degrees, inserting on its distal third. Isometric studies have revealed the central band is shortest in supination, which has led us to set the tension of the BLB construct in 60 degrees of supination. The radius is exposed between the extensor carpi radialis longus and brachia radialis interval. Care is taken to protect the dorsal radial sensory nerve. The bone graft of the BLB is inset close to the pronator teres insertion, then directed at a 20 degree angle from the radius to the ulna and tunneled beneath the extensors. The graft is then countersunk at the ulnar osteotomy site with the forearm in 60 degrees of supination. In most cases, it is fixed with a single cortical screw. A cadaver dissection by Pony Don't Lorry demonstrates some key points of the procedure. The forceps show the insertion of the native central band, which is not always distinguishable when it's ruptured. When planning a central band reconstruction, the ulnar shortening plate should be placed volarly or immediately to allow room for the bone graft insertion. A large clamp is passed from the ulna to the radius in the proximal origin site on the radius defined. A one centimeter graft is pre prepared with good end bony blocks. A trough is created in the radius to inset the proximal bony, bony block, which is usually fixed with a single cortical screw. The attached graph is then tunneled beneath the extensors at approximately 20 degrees to inset on a predetermined trough in the ulna. Care should be taken in passing the graph to avoid injury to the terminal branches of the posterior nerve. The ulna bone graph is inset in maximal tension and with the forearm at 60 degrees of supination. Here we see a radiographic view of the final construct. Note the ulna has been shortened to 2 mm negative ulnar variance. The bone grafts are well inset into the respective radius and ulna. In 1992, we started a prospective series defining the role of ulnar shortening osteotomy and bone ligament bone graft in a chronic SLA cases.
Our 10-year results were published in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2018. Our study group of 46 patients epitomized the classic demographics of a patient with axial instability. Two-thirds were male with an average age of 35, and only 11% of the cases were the initial diagnosis of axial instability correctly made. The renal head had been excised primarily in 33 patients and secondarily in 12. The average time of secondary resection was 5.3 months. Silastic prostheses, which were the radial head prosthesis of the day, all failed. The inner osseous membrane instability was identified on average at 10 months post radial head excision, with 75% being seen in under two years. For the treating surgeon, that means he will see, he will still be practicing when his axial instability patient returns with wrist pain. Prior to the study, 46 patients had 74 failed surgeries in an attempt to correct their ulnar impaction. One patient had a zipper tattooed on his forearm so we'd know where to make the next incision. Ulnar variance pre-op averaged in average 3 millimeters with a range of 1 to 8 millimeters in the static pronated position. 25% had evidence of lunate impaction on plain x-rays, 12% showed distal real ulnar joint arthritis, and one-third had mild elbow arthritis. In our follow-up of these initial patients at 10 plus years, no patient was worse. Wrist pain improved in 93%. Elbow arthritis worsened over time due to the nature of the original injury and some ulnar trochlea arthritis. Radiocapitellar impingement was resolved. No radial head prostheses were used in this study. Most importantly, no secondary surgery was required for axial instability. 83% of functional motion in rotation was preserved. Grip strength improved from 60% to 86%. Standard outcome measures also improved with the DASH averaging 23, the SF36 showing excellent outcomes on all parameters, the Mayo elbow performance score showing excellent results, and the patient-related wrist evaluation score being excellent. No patient deteriorated to preoperative ulnar impaction variants. We did see a loss on average of 2 millimeters compared to the initial postoperative variants. Complications in the series included two non-unions and smokers that required revision surgery to finally heal, three delayed ulnar unions that healed with immobilization and electrical stimulation, two patients with extensor tendon stiffness that improved with therapy, one patient with a transient posterior interosseous nerve palsy, and 19% of patients with weather-related knee ache, which was mild, but none had any knee disability. Along the way, we had a, a unique opportunity to examine the fate of the bone ligament bone graft. A 38-year-old woman, six years post-IOM reconstruction, sustained a new distal radial fracture while horse jumping. At the time of her ORIF of the distal radius fracture, we removed her ulnar shortening plate and biopsied the bone ligament bone. The biopsy 
was indistinguishable from normal ligament. In summary, for acute Essex-Lepresti injuries, prompt recognition and early treatment of all three levels of injury will yield excellent results. In the chronic injury, ulnar shortening osteotomy and bone ligament bone graft reconstruction will provide a satisfactory outcome. In treating the Essex Lepresti injury, as in all complex upper extremity trauma and reconstruction, is close to ocean sailing in a high wind. It's adrenaline, it's fear, it's a constant challenge, it's a learning experience and an adventure. Hopefully the treatment algorithm presented will result in a happy outcome for both the patient and the surgeon.